Amen. Well, good morning. You guys doing okay? Yeah? Remember, though, it doesn't really matter how you're doing. God's still good. <laughs> and that's the truth. So, yeah, so this morning, um, I just wanted to, uh, to share something with you. Right when I got here this morning, we, uh, we got some uh, very difficult news um, that uh, another pastor in town here, uh, Mark Henning from the, the Word Church, lost his son last night. And so, um, I just want to take a moment and uh, let's, let's pray for the family. God, we just uh, come before you and we lift up Mark to you. We lift up uh, his wife and all their children, God, in this difficult time. God, we ask that you'd, you'd comfort them. Lord, we ask that you'd be with them. Lord, we don't pretend to understand every part of why these things happen, but we do know that you are good. And God, that you're faithful. And Lord, that you're, you, you save, you reach and you save, and your salvation, the gospel is far-reaching. And Jesus, you are love. And so we're asking God, as our hearts are heavy, and I'm sure that the family's hurting, I, I ask for a supernatural just comfort and love just lavished upon their lives, Lord. Is, um, just told them we we're praying this morning, and he said thank you, and so that's what we're doing, God. We're lifting up your servants to you and ask that you'd be with them in their time of need. And we're thankful that you are, God. We're thankful that your grace is sufficient. And so we ask that you do that work in their lives that only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, man, difficult, difficult morning. I'm already, it's not even, you know, it's not even second service over yet. And I'm all done. I'm spent. So I'm emotionally over. You guys get the leftovers this morning. <laughs> but I'll tell you this morning, I, I, I have to. I mean, hearing all the praise reports and all of the, just the, um, the awesome news from VBS. I mean, we had like between, I think it was 15 to 17 kids except Jesus in VBS, right? So isn't that so awesome? And, and, it, and it, you know, whether these sweet little hearts, whether they, it was their first time or their fifth time, I'm just so thankful for the servants that came and, and opened that opportunity. I mean, they gave their hearts, their lives. And you know what? You guys are nothing special. You're just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. But it's God doing the work. And that's what it is. It's, it's Christ and a, a bunch of crazy nut Christian people coming down here. Some of you guys taking time off of work to minister. And I'm just, as a, as a pastor, I'm just, my heart's just full. I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful for you guys. And so it's just, again, it's just him. It's all him. He's so good. Amen? Okay, so the next thing on the agenda, today is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you fathers. And uh, I'm going to acknowledge you guys a little bit here, and I'm going to do it a little bit different uh, with the fathers than I did with the mothers on Mother's Day last month. And uh, I, I think that this is probably the difference. Maybe it's just my opinion. You might want to just tell me to shut it, but that's fine. But my observation is that with mothers, Moms, by nature, seem, seem to step into the role of mom like 150%. They just like naturally, they're a mom. Boom, right? But fathers have the potential to identify more with other things in this life, sometimes over being a father of their career or a hobby or whatever it is in life. Sometimes I just, again, maybe it's just me, I think fathers have the potential to identify with other things. And so, fathers and men here this morning, I want to challenge you to identify the way God would have you identify. I want to challenge you to have your identity first as a Christian, second as a husband, and third as a father. First as a Christian in your relationship with your father. Through the person of Jesus and the communion of the Holy Spirit, I challenge you, fathers, to allow this to define who you are. 
Second, as husbands, (laughs) uh, it's not any easier. Husbands, loving your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. I don't know if you've ever gone through Ephesians 5, 25 in a study. There's like a list of things for the women to do, and the guys get one thing. And I'm so thankful, but it's still, it's still, it's still the one thing on the list of one things. I got my work cut out for me the rest of my life to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And so the second thing, love your wives. And third, fathers, third this morning as fathers, showing compassion to your children as the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. That's Psalm 103, verse 13. A challenge for you to love your kids, to show them compassion as the Lord shows compassion to us. And so I challenge us this year to sincerely, intentionally be present in the lives of our children and our family, and to not just tell them, but to show them who Jesus is by our personal relationship with him. That's the challenge. Now, I want to encourage you fathers this morning, because if you're here, (laughs) then you're a rare man. A man who really desires to lead his family in the ways of God, and you're, you're becoming more rare. In 2021, to find a man who follows God first is, is becoming more and more a rare thing. You are a dying breed, and I'm thankful that you're here. And I'm thankful that you're stepping up to the challenge. Fathers, men, you are valuable. And the world needs to see, desperately, more men like you, more fathers like you. So, this morning, all of the fathers, would you please stand with me? I know you're going, oh man, stand up, come on. (laughs) All the fathers, stand up. Next, all of the husbands, would you please stand up? And you know what? All the men, anyone who is a man, would you stand up this morning? Austin is a surrogate father, amen. And the reason I'm having everyone stand up is is not just because of your potential to be a father in the future, but because of just what Wendy said about Austin. It's because you have the potential to be a father figure to a young person in your life, to stand up for the things that God stands for, to show evil where evil is, to be that light, to be that man that God has designed men to be. And that's something that's fading in our world. And I'm thankful for you. So now, ladies, if you would put your hands on your man or a guy next to you, shoulder, <laughs> not, not, not crazy, just shoulder. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these men. God, I thank you for men that stand for something bigger than themselves. Who stand for God. And I pray that you continue to remind these men of who they are in you, of their heritage. I pray that you continue to empower these men to walk as a man following you. Lord, not in pride, but in humility, in meekness, and in strength, leading not only their children, but all those around them. But God, I would say especially their children, being a father to them. Lord, we thank you for these men. Bless them today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you. Yes, amen. Okay, now we're picking up in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you would, grab your Bible, pull it out, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you need a Bible, you can raise your hand. Somebody will bring you a Bible so you can follow along. Or, Or boot your Bible up. Open the app, if that's what you're going to do. Go ahead. So we're picking up in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So now while you're turning there, we're falling smack dab in the middle of this four-chapter section of Paul really defending himself, and really he's comparing himself 
to a group of people within the Corinthian church in front of the Corinthian church. I want you to remember something. These letters were meant to be brought to the church and read in front of everybody. And we're going we're to go through some difficult things that Paul's going to say, some tough uh, shots, if you will, in order to keep them in line. Um, and so Paul is writing this letter. He's kind of comparing, defending himself and comparing himself to a group of people in the church for the sake of saving the church as a whole from following false teachers. He called them uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually just named it. These people are false apostles. They've self-appointed themselves as apostles. They're false teachers who are teaching a false doctrine in the church at Corinth and who are leading the church away from the simplicity, in Paul's own words, the simplicity that is in Christ. And they're setting them up with all kinds of hoops to jump through in order to be right with God. Let me just remind you, anything else that would make you right with God besides Jesus is not true. It's false. This is not, well, there's nothing else. It's Christ alone. My hope is found. Amen? So they're leading these guys away from the truths, and they're leading them into things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, which is, again, another direct quote from what Paul has already been saying. And so Paul, as the founder of this church, not just the founder, but as the father of this church, is fed up with these guys trying to rip off the church. I mean, and that's just basically where he's at. He, he is, as a father, is, he's gone into kind of like, I don't know, you could call it mama bear mode if you want. He's, he's ready to stop the false things happening. But it's out of a heart, really appropriately for today, it's out of a heart of fatherly love and care and correction. And, and there, comes, there comes a time in, in the life of a father as a parent when it's no longer buddy time, it's time to be a dad. It's time to parent. It's time to call sin, sin. It's time to call truth, truth, and what's right, right. And sometimes it's time to, how, how, do, they, how do they put it? It's time to um, lay the board of education to the seat of learning. <laughs> right? You hear what I'm saying? So it's time to correct and discipline. And so this is where we pick up. Uh, last week, Paul defended his apostolic position by a specific topic. It was by uh, revelations and visions that we saw. Paul had many revelations. He had many visions. And the Lord spoke to him and showed up in so many ways. Jesus showed up in his prison one time. Jesus showed up at his conversion, asked him why he was battling against him persecuting him. Um, and so anyways, Paul had so many of these visions and these revelations. And so this week, he's going to start off with signs and wonders and mighty deeds there in verse, I think it's 11. He's going he's to start off with a little bit different of a thing, but another thing that identifies the apostles. So I, as we're talking about identifying as apostles, I just kind of want to go through this for, for just a moment. These miracles are a part of something that was distinct among the 12 apostles. That's a, that's a distinction right there too, right? How many? 12. There was 12 apostles in the sense of these 12. And, and hopefully I'll bring some clarity to this. But the miracles and these miraculous healings and things, it was one of the things that defined them as the 12 apostles. It, it separated them from any other disciples or apostles. Although miracles could happen, there was a high frequency of miracles that were happening in these apostles. It was one of the things that set them apart. There's a couple of other things that set apart uniquely these 12 apostles. Uh, the first one that I wanted to mention is Revelation 21.14. And in, in Revelation 21.14 is a description of the new Jerusalem. And on the foundation, on the 12 foundations of the wall of the new Jerusalem are the names of the 12 apostles. There's something we can take note of and say, when we get there and we see it, we're going to be able to walk up and go, oh yeah, there's their names on the foundations. And so this is something that is distinct. It separates the 12 from the rest of the disciples or apostles. Another thing is that these apostles had the authority, when they were inspired to, to write the word of God, which is a lot of authority, 
something that I don't touch. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to write a book of Isaac. No way, Jose, right? <clears throat> and the reason that I bring this up, the reason that I'm kind of pointing out the difference between the 12 apostles and the difference between maybe apostles today is because people want to argue over or, or, or decide if there are apostles today. And I would say that there could be, but I would say that it's not going to be in the same sense of the meaning as these 12 apostles. It's going to be different. Now, I want to read to you really quickly the definition from the Strong's Concordance and from the Interlinear, Interlinear Bible. Easy for me to say. So listen to this. This is the definition of the apostles. A delegate, especially an ambassador of the gospel, officially a commissioner of Christ with distinguishing miraculous powers, uh, a messenger that is sent. The other definition, a delegate, a messenger, one sent forth with orders specifically applied to the 12 apostles of Christ, but in a broader sense applied to other eminent Christian teachers. So there's the definitions. I would say that there could be apostles today, but the biggest problem I have is with the biggest problem I have with people who want to identify themselves and call themselves apostles today is there's usually so much of an emphasis on the title that I am an apostle, which is, I believe, unhealthy. It's an unhealthy thing and, and directly goes in opposition to my example, which is Jesus. Man, Jesus never went around and said, you guys, come listen to me. I'm the Messiah. I mean, he spoke to them, he challenged them, he drew them in, but he never did it under a, a, a title of authority. Well, I mean, except for when he flipped the money changers' tables over, and that was a little bit different. That was with dealing with the religious rulers. So I just wanted to say, there's, there's a warning, there's, a, there's a, a danger in wanting to have this title. And to the point, even Paul, like we looked at last week, God gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble because God knows how men are and that they like to be exalted. And like, even like Paul said last week, he gave him this lest he be exalted above measure. Lest he be exalted above measure. So we, mankind, desire to be exalted and lifted up. We need to be kept in check by the Lord. But we need to be able to stay and remain humble and lowly like our Savior Jesus. Now, thinking about this definition of apostle that we just looked at, I would say there is a definition, there is a people group that are the closest to that definition today. Anybody want to guess what the name of that people group would be? That I would, what was that? Pastors. Pastors? In my mind, the first thing I think of is missionaries. Missionaries. I mean, those are modern-day apostles. They're sent. They go out on the mission field to, to share the word to a people group or to a, sp a specific region. And oftentimes, because all they have is the word and the Holy Spirit, oftentimes they're accompanied by miraculous healings and miracles. When I think of a, a real mission, a real apostle, I'm sorry, a real apostle, I think missionaries. Not the guy that walks in and goes, I'm the Apostle Bob, and you guys should fix me a nice dinner. And now, uh, that's from experience. I met an Apostle Bob, and he wanted to come in and use his authority. And I'm just like, well, this doesn't feel like Jesus to me. This doesn't feel like a guy that's for the church. It feels like he's using the church to gain. Anyways, we're going to see some more into that example. So to me, I think missionaries are apostles. And I've got to keep praying for our missionaries. Amen? Okay, so now that I'm done laying all this out, let's go to the text. Let's pick up here. Paul is dealing with this group, self-appointed apostles, speaking to the church, and he's reluctant to boast. Look with me there at verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. Paul says, I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been committed, I'm sorry, commended by you. For in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. 
Man, I really love verse 11 here. Paul says a few things. Besides saying, again, that he didn't want to boast because of the church in Corinth, but he says he was sort of pushed to, uh, and it was the last thing that he could do to reach them. It's like I'm at the end of every way that I'm trying to reach you guys, so I'm going to go ahead and do what these false apostles are doing. I'm going to boast so that you can see side by side the comparison of an apostle of Jesus and the other guy, super duper apostles. And Paul says, though he should have been commended by them, which is true. When you think about the Corinthian church, they of all people, he lived with them for a year and a half. He lived openly with them. They of all people should have been able to look at Paul and say, you know what, guys? Paul's not what you're saying he is. I know the guy. I watched him make tents so that he could continue to, to, to serve here and not be a burden to the church. They knew who Paul was. So he should have been commended by them, but they didn't. And he's going to go on to sort of talk about this uh, in the last half of verse 11, but he states it first. He says, In nothing was he behind those super or more eminent apostles. And Paul's saying, Look, there's nothing that they have done or claim to do that I haven't done sincerely. There's nothing, there's, there's no part of what they've done that I haven't done. And Paul, he ends with my favorite little piece here. And it's kind of like what he didn't say. Paul doesn't say, there's nothing that they have done that I haven't done. I am an apostle. What does he say? He says, there's nothing that, that they have done that I haven't done, though I am nothing. Paul's heart. <laughs> Paul's heart. I love Paul's heart. He doesn't come off saying, I, I'm, I'm an apostle. Give me the respect I'm due. He says, I know what I am. I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about the somebody that saved my soul. And he'll do the same for you. I love Paul's heart. It's a true heart that understands that every good thing that I am or that I have or that I get to be a part of, it's just a part of who I am in Christ. You know who Paul really is? He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of my all-time favorite sections, in verse 9, Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And then, my favorite verse, or verse 10, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. It's all God. His grace toward me will not be in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, and, and yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. And I'm so thankful for Paul's heart and his example of what a true apostle of Jesus is. A humble man. A man who knew in humility who he really was that he was just a sinner saved by grace. Not flashing his title, but knowing that he's nothing apart from Jesus. The humility of a believer and the zeal of someone who had been touched and changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he goes on in verse 12 and says, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance, in signs, in wonders, and in mighty deeds. For what is it in which you were inferior to the other churches, except that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. So we get an interesting section here, verses 12 and 13. We see clearly and simply that Paul says, you are equal to all any other church that is a church that was started by any apostle, and especially by myself. So Paul's revealing to them, well, there's nothing different. There's nothing inferior about you guys here in Corinth. The signs of an apostle, the healings, the miraculous things, those things happen here, just like they did everywhere else. The conversions, the power of the word going forth, the gospel going forth, it was present here just like everywhere else. The only difference 
was that all the other churches supported Paul financially, and Corinth didn't. That's the only difference. The, the only thing that, that, that was a, a differing you know, a deal that happened was they didn't support Paul. And Paul says something interesting there at the end. I don't know if you noticed that. He says, forgive me this wrong. Now, there's a lot of commentaries that want to say, oh, good old Paul with his sarcastic jabs, forgive me this wrong. When, and it could have been a sarcastic thing. But when I, when I think about Paul and when I think about his heart for this church at Corinth, at the same time, this honestly was something that they were lacking. It was something that they were missing out on. Now, they still had some problems in the church. They still had some sin issues going on in their lives that they were sorting out, but they were growing. And in the beginning of this letter, we got to see how Paul was proud of their progress, that they received the letter of correction. They were growing. And Paul wanted their growth to be sincere. And this was one area, one place of blessing that they were lacking in. And it was in giving. Now, I'm not going to go into or talk about giving. We, we talked about that a couple of weeks in a row going through this section of Scripture but there is a blessing that comes with giving that they were missing out on. They were lacking. Paul was, was honest when he said, there's one thing that you lack. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. And, and there's a blessing that God promised, and this is something just jotted down. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12, is the promise that God gives to the nation of Israel when he tells them, you guys are doing something wrong. You're robbing me. And they're going, what? We're not robbing you. What do you mean? He says, you're not giving the tithe. You're not giving and you're robbing me. But he says to them, if you do this, I'm going to give you a promise that if you test me in this thing, see if I don't take care of you. See if I don't bless you. See if I don't open up the windows of heaven. Now that's, a, that's kind of like a phrase thing that they used to use back in the day for like ultimate blessing. Open up the windows of heaven that God would pour his blessing out upon them. So it's a challenge there that he is, he knows the church in Corinth is lacking in. But he continues on challenging them to give. And he continues further to share that they have not been robbed nor taken advantage of. So he goes on verse 14, look at verse 14 with me. He says, now for the third time, I am ready to come to you. And I will not be burdensome to you, for I do not seek yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. So in verses 14 and 15 here, we definitely get some of Paul's his heart, his fatherly heart towards the, the church here at Corinth. A heart to lay up for them, not to take from them. A father's heart not to be burdensome to them, not to take but to give. Uh, as he said there, a heart not to, not to spend but to be spent for their souls. I'm sorry, he said a heart to spend and to be spent for their souls. And another, I believe fatherly heart of Paul there is at the end of verse 15. And it appears to me to be the heart of a father that's correcting or disciplining his child. He says, the more I love you or parent you or correct you out of love, it seems the less I am loved. I don't know if you are a parent or how long you've been a parent, but if you are, and it's been any period of time, especially with teenage children, you understand that in loving and taking a stand for the cause of love against a behavior or a sinful activity, <laughs> you realize you become less loved. Now, it's just something that we go through. There's one of my children there. I don't know if you've ever gotten one of these, but that look of like piercing, I'm going to get you kind of look. I know, there's, I don't want to name the person. <laughs> Too many of you know this person. But to be like, oh, you know, you need to do this. And then to get that, like, what, I don't, what is the look? It's like, it's like I'm looking right through your soul, and I loathe you. 
that's the kind of look. You know, and, and when I get that look as a father, I have to gently come in and remind the individual, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this not because of me, but because you chose this by the actions that you just had. And so there's a time in our lives when we're not the buddy, we're the parent. And because we love, if you don't love me this day, that's okay with me, because I love you too much to let this one go. And that's where Paul's at with these guys in their life. He's, he's saying, now I know I'm trying to love you, I'm not trying to steal, I'm not trying to take, and I feel like I'm getting that evil eye from you, but that's okay. I care enough to be your father at this point so that you could be corrected. And I love that little section there in the middle of verse 14. I don't know if you saw it there, but Paul says, For I do not seek yours, I seek you. And this is God's heart toward us, toward his kids. He wants us. He has the best in mind for us. And sometimes God does ask us to give something up or to go a direction that we don't want to go. It's never because he wants that thing or wants to see us suffering or miserable. It's because sometimes the hard thing is the best thing. And that's what God does. He's got our best. And let me just say this, and I say this often, but it's, it's a truth. <laughs> and I think we all need to hear it again. God is more for us than we are for ourselves. He is more about our future and our eternity and our well-being than we are for ourselves. And so often we think, no, there's no one for me more than me. And he brings us through hard things because he cares about you more. <laughs> he wants more. He has more for you. And as a father to the church, Paul said, he would very gladly spend and be spent. And I, I just have to look at that and go, wow, Paul. I mean, sometimes when you're working with somebody that's difficult to work with, there comes a point where you're like, I'm not going to stop fighting, but I'm done, bro. You know what I mean? Like, I'm over it. I can't believe I just said that. So my son, the other day, I just got to tell you this. My son, four years old, he's strapped into his car seat. Me and him are at the store. We pull up next to this car, and he goes, sick car, bro. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Anyways, just a, a cool moment. So it doesn't have anything to do with anything. It was just. So that's where I got that line from. I got it from him. Sick car, bro. But what a heart of Paul, man. Paul, he would gladly spin and be sent. He wasn't like, man, I'm going through all this difficult stuff. I'm done with you guys. He said, nope, I'm going to keep going through the hard stuff. What a heart of the father that Paul has for this church. Now, it's difficult for Paul. It takes a certain kind of man, one filled with the Spirit, one who is, well, one who knows who he's serving and knows who he is in Christ. But it would seem that the negatives of this section are probably what these super apostles are doing, right? Which would be, they are being burdensome. They are seeking for themselves, seeking that they would be gaining. They aren't laying up for the church, but taking from them. And they're gladly spending, I'm sorry, they're not gladly spending or being spent, but again, they're taking. So this is what these other guys are doing. Paul's the contrast. Verse 16, back to the text. But be that as it may, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you by cunning. Did I take advantage of you by, those, uh, by any of those whom I sent to you? I urged Titus and sent our brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? So this is another <laughs> interesting section, a little bit difficult to interpret, but what Paul's talking about is the gift that the, the churches were gathering together to take to Jerusalem. Okay, so they were gathering a gift, and Paul had, if you remember earlier, I can't remember which chapter it is in 2 Corinthians, there was three guys that were going to all go together, and if Paul could go, he was going to go with them too, so that there was so much accountability, it was crazy. They were going to go above par in order to be um, above reproach with the money that they were handling and taking back to Jerusalem. 
So this is what Paul's talking about. Did any of these guys rip you off? Now, it's, it's really interesting. Verse 16 is kind of difficult right there, where it, it, it's hard to know exactly what he's saying, especially because the last word in verse 16 is the Greek word dolos, which means decoy, and is translated as deceit or guile. So it, it's, it makes it even more difficult to understand at the second half of verse 16. Being crafty, I caught you by guile or deceit. That's, that's, an, that's an interesting one. Um, and that, even those, knowing what those words means, almost makes it even more difficult. Now, some groups want to take advantage of the scripture and say, what this means is that to get people into the church, to get them saved, you can do anything, even deceive them and trick them. Eh, wrong answer. I mean, obviously, God is a God of justice and truth, and the truth stands on its own. The truth is, is who he is. He's not a God that deceives people in order to bring them to the truth. He is, he is truth. And so that's the wrong answer there. But with this difficult thought, God isn't, he doesn't lie, he's just, he's true. But with this difficult thought, it would seem that the guys there, those false apostles, were accusing Paul of somehow, get, after they gathered that money, meeting them and taking the money from them. Okay, so one commentary said that it was more of a sarcastic thing. Oh, yeah, I tricked you guys and took all your money. Are you kidding me? Which is to say, why don't you test that and ask anybody that was with us what happened with that money? We did it all on purpose so that we would be above reproach. And so that's, a, that's the best interpretation I got. Don't let that little verse catch you off guard. But Paul says, being crafty, I caught you by deceit. And then he continued on with verses 17 and 18. He said, did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? And the answer is no. I urged Titus and sent um, our brother with him. So they got two guys. And Ty did Titus take advantage of you? No. Did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? They were all together for accountability. So he basically challenges them to remember, you guys, think back, how did we handle the money? All of these accusations should just fall to the wayside. Verse 19, he says again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ. So Paul, do you think I'm making excuses to cover a lie? And he comes back to this thought that he goes to quite often. Everything we do in life, we do openly before God. Whenever you think you're being sneaky, God sees it. You're not being sneaky. That's what Paul's saying. Look, are you kidding me? Everything we do, we do before God. We're not trying to excuse. We're not trying to rip you off. We speak before God. And then once again, Paul, reveal, Paul reveals his heart and his motive to us through this correction, verse 19b there, it says, but we do all things, beloved, for your, what? Edification, for your building up. Verse 20, for I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as I do not wish. I'm sorry, such as you do not wish. So we got some more fatherly talk on Father's Day. Just a, and, and really, it's a sweet fatherly heart, followed by, I wouldn't call it a threat, but more like a promise. You ever had one of those as a father? Are you threatening me? No, this is a promise. This is just what I'm telling you. So Paul, again, uh, his reason for everything that he does, whether it's a letter like the one he's writing now, whether it's a visit, whether it's an, an edification, whether it's prayer, whether it's a sharp rebuke and an exhortation, whatever he does, he says there in the end of verse 19, he does all things for their well-being, their building up, their edification. And there in verse 20, Paul again reveals that heart. His biggest fear is that he would come and find them not changed by the gospel and a personal walk with Jesus Christ. Not giving or living a life for the glory of God. 
And I, and I think, man, that's got to be one of the biggest fears and one of the biggest desires of any pastor is, I want to see you walk with God. That's what I want. I don't want to see you going back to the things, those former things in the world that are really just the trap and the lie. That they would somehow be deceived to living in those former things. And Paul, man, he did not want to find them like that. But if he did, and this is that fatherly promise, if I do find you that, he says, then you're not going to find me like you want to find me. There's the promise. <laughs> so sort of like if you, if, you, if you tell your older kids, hey, I'm going to the store. When I get back, your room should be clean. If I, if I come home and I walk in and I find you playing video games, you're not going to like how I am. I mean, that's like what Paul's saying, right? I'm giving you this opportunity and I'm going to come to you. And if I find you in this way, you're not going to like it. And guess what? He's not going to like it either, right? Paul's like, I'm not going to like it. It's usually how it is as a parent. But it's, there, it's those moments, once again, where I'm not your buddy. I'm your dad. I'm your father. And this is for your good, for your growth. And so that's what Paul, boy, boy, Paul, what an awesome heart. What a loving. And I just have to tell you as a pastor, correction or any kind of rebuke like that, it's the hardest. It's tough. You just labor over it. Your heart breaks over it. You don't want to have to do it. But Paul's faithful in it. And I'm thankful to have his example. So then Paul goes on by giving them this list of things that he's fearing they would be doing um, and that would be continuing on in the church. He says here as we, as we wrap it up this morning, he says, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath. He doesn't want to come to the church see the church looking like the world around it. He doesn't want to see the fights, the, the jealousies over one another, the selfish ambitions, the, the backbitings, the talkings, the whispers. He doesn't want to see the conceits and the, the tumults, you know, the fightings. Lest, he says, when I come again, my God will humble me among you. And I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which with they have practiced. He, he's like, man, I don't want to come in. And, and he counts it, having to correct them, he counts it as being humbled, as being like, I don't want this. I don't want to do it. I want to come in and edify. I want to see a church that's willing to grow, willing to take correction. And I love, I love Paul's heart here. But he gives this list. And we might look at this list and think, man, you know, you want us to be perfect little cookie cutter Christians, Paul. You want us to do all these things and this, this list of deeds in order to be right with you or right with God. I'm not sure where you're going with this, but this isn't what Paul's heart is. Paul's not looking for perfection. He's looking for perfect righteousness. You might think, what? Isn't that the same thing? Problem is you don't have perfect, perfect righteousness unless you get it where? At the cross, through Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for perfection. <laughs> I'm not looking for you to keep all the things on this list. In fact, what does he call them to do? He says at the, there at the end of verse 21, for many who have sinned before and have not repented. I'm not saying you need to just be perfect and do everything right. What I'm saying is you need to repent. And you know what? You might sin again before the end of today. What should you do then? You should repent. And then you might sin in the morning. And then you should repent. And then you might sin at noon. And what I'm saying is the most powerful force, the most powerful weapon isn't us being stronger and trying to get it right. It's for us to go to Jesus every time. To come to Jesus and repent once again. To say, Lord, I need you in my life. I'm a sinner. There's, there's really two things that that does. Either you're going to come to Jesus over and over and you're finally going to just say, I can't do it and I give up. And you're going to go down a bumpy road, probably come back. Or you're going to go through a process of realizing, I'm so messed up, God. And every time I fall short, I come back and I just realize I'm a mess. And you go through a process called brokenness. And you become healed. And you become whole. <laughs> You realize it's his strength or nothing at all. And you run to the Father again and again and again and again.
again and again. The best place to be. So as we close this morning, I want to ask Caleb to come in. I don't know if he's done with the, the youth ministry or not, but that's the challenge. The challenge is to be real with the Lord and to run to him again and again and again and meet him at the cross and allow that purifying work of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And that's the truth of life. Amen? Let's all stand together. God, we come before you this morning and we're thankful for your word that it reveals our hearts, Lord. It reveals the truth that we need you, God. And Lord, I ask that you continue to work in the lives of your people, Lord. And I pray this morning, this moment, that, that, that all of your church here would agree and say, God, I need you. Would agree and say, God, I'm a sinner still. And I need you just as much today as I did the first moment I accepted you. <laughs> I need you to walk with me into the future, and our future is bright because of you. Lord, teach us that all the power in the universe is at the cross. Lord, teach us to walk humbly with our God, to love mercy. Teach us to have simple trust and faith in you. And I thank you that you're still working and you're moving. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill your church. God, we need you. We need to be lights. We need to have the truth. We need to be fathers and men, mothers and women that know you and are changed by you and are different in this world. So we thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen. 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 God bless you guys.